Today's species spotlight is on a really cool species of lizard. And I know most of what I do is about snakes because I'm definitely more of a snake guy, but I do keep several species of lizards and they're still just really cool animals in general. So today we're gonna talk about one that is gaining a lot of popularity lately, and that is the Cuban false chameleon or sometimes called the bearded anole. Now, these guys come from the island of Cuba, pretty obviously. There are a couple different subspecies and species that are all inadvertently grouped together and called false chameleon. For the most part, what we have are the Barbatus genus, or, or not genus, but species, is what we usually have in the hobby. Now, the, you know, bearded anole or anole that I and everyone I knew called for the longest time, um, and as usual, people yell at me about names, and I guess anole is probably the more correct um, name for them, but I'm probably going to slip up and call it a null too, so just forgive me. That's why I usually go with the Cuban false chameleon. So, that being said, these guys are a species of a noli lizard. It's a huge group of, it's a huge, huge group of lizards. They all usually have a lot of similarities and things in common, usually very arboreal, fairly diurnal, usually have a big dewlap, but there's a lot of adaptations about the false chameleon that make it really special and unique. So obviously they get their name from those little spikes that are on their dewlap and they will inflate it and they will do their little like, you know, defensive territorial head bob, especially between males. Um, I don't see it because I just have my pair and I do in fact know that they are a pair. Um, they also get their name, the false chameleon for quite a few different reasons. So the first thing is they do have independently moving eyes. They can move their eyes and look in different directions. Maybe not quite as wide of a range of movement as a lot of the chameleon species, but they still definitely can. They also can change color, not the dramatic effects that a lot of the chameleon species can. Again, not to blend in with their surroundings, but more to do with like the temperature, the daylight, the time of day, mood, hormonal, all sorts of things like that. This is really more what they change and the false chameleons are very similar, but not quite as much. They mostly go from light to dark, um, where I've seen some that are close to like a gray white, like a white oaks, like gray rat snake, to almost black, to where it's very dark gray brown, closer to black. Um, they have both claws and toe pads, so that allows them to climb on sheer glass almost as well as they can grip and climb branches and rocks, which is really, really cool. They have this really cool, unique mottled skin to where obviously this is part of their cryptid nature where they blend in. They're very, I should say, they're, they're very sedentary. They don't move a lot when compared to a lot of other lizards, especially anoles, to where they are, they've actually even been documented in the wild not moving most of the time, well over 60% of the time, for, for the most part, when they weren't like, you know, ran up on and so they moved to run away, they only really move to adjust temperature, to adjust light and to look for food, but they're very inactive. They're very deliberate with their movements, which also might be another part of why we call them chameleons. They also, like a lot of chameleons, have kind of a little crest on the back of their head or a cask which is really cool, like the panther chameleons um, and some of like the carpet chameleons, they do have a little bit of a bony cask on the back of their heads. These guys have it as well. They also will, they, they do have a tongue that they'll use to grab food, but it's not like the chameleon that will sit there and from, you know, quite a distance grab it. They kind of lunge forward, but just kind of like, you know, alien grab it with their tongue and pull it back in their mouth and then in the wild, these guys are insectivores and they eat a wide variety of insects, but really they're well known for and they do love eating snails in the wild. And what they do is they'll grab the snail and they'll sit there and they'll just kind of like munch on it. And when they're munching on it, they have this kind of like cute chewing that they do that they also, as you've seen, they do it with crickets and plenty of other different insect prey items where instead of just kind of like chomp, chomp down like a bearded dragon, um, they will sit there and just kind of like go over on it. They like mull it over in their mouths a little bit. They're really, really cool. Now these guys, um, as I said before, they come from Cuba. So for a long time, there are a lot of them were wild caught. 
and they weren't really bred in captivity very much. And I, I've seen recently, like they started to pop up a year or two ago, um, but very rarely, they seem to be almost seasonal. Um, but now more people have finally started to figure out how to breed them properly. Um, my guys are a little small. Um, a large male can hit like six, seven, eight inches from nose to the tip of the tail. Mine are still pretty small. They're working on it, but I have seen mating behavior from them. Um, and just like with a lot of lizards, you can tell they do ephemeral pores on their lower legs and by their, um, by their vents. Um, and you can see that even in small ones, I'm not very good at it because I don't work with lizards as much. Um, I am admittedly much more weak on my knowledge of lizards in general than I am of most snake species. Um, but that's why I got these pair when they were small and they are still growing. The female honestly was a thin, was very thin. She kind of has a thing where it's kind of well known with these guys where they love to eat snails. And it seemed, and according to a couple different people out there, like Clint uh, from Clint's Reptiles does a great video about these guys where he notes that babies really like to only eat snails and they have a harder time switching over to insects. So when I got her, she was very thin, which is essentially why I got her. Um, it was essentially kind of thrown at me. But she does eat, and, I, and I've seen her eat, and she is putting on weight, and she is growing, but she's still pretty thin. Um, so I think that might be one of the only kind of, like, barrier to entries is that you really need to look for a larger, older, more established reptile before you decide to take one in as a pet. That being said, still really good reptiles. Because they're much more sedentary, they're much more... You know, they don't move a whole lot. They don't panic and run. They're very calm. They have very calm, easy dispositions, which makes them good for pet reptiles because a lot of people want to handle their reptiles. And with a lot of lizard species, it's they're really more display animals a lot of the time until you get to some of the larger ones. Um, and so an animal that isn't going to run or jump off um, is a lot better of an animal to, for handling. They don't have the, they don't really have the ability to detach their tail. Um, and their tail is semi prehensile, so you don't ever want to grab them by their tail. You don't really need to. Like I said, they're pretty calm. You can very kind of easily just kind of scoop them up a little bit and they'll usually just kind of hang out. Don't really want to bite too well. Their teeth aren't very sharp. They have very powerful jaws though, again, for crushing those snails. Really, really cool species of snake, oh, snake. Really cool species of lizard. Um, just, you know, they are diurnal, like all of the different anoles that, so you always want to make sure that they, Give them plenty of UVA and UVB. Um, you make sure you want to give them a decent hot spot, you know, in the mid 90s probably. Um, Cuba, it doesn't ever get super hot there, but high humidity, um, plenty in, of sun to where they will, I, as you've seen in the video, it was they both would come up because they're in a three foot tall enclosure. They come up and they're basking under the heat, under the light, and then they'll move down slightly and usually kind of turn away and roll around the branches to where just like arms and like one side of them is exposed to that light a little bit further down, except for in the morning. And then sometimes closer to the evening, right before they turn off, they'll come a little bit up to the top again. But that's where they'll stay most of the time until it comes time to feeding. And even then they will stay at the top and look for the crickets or if I'm tong feeding them mealworms or they're still a little small for superworms. They usually just get mealworms or tiny little dubia babies. Um, then after they're gone from the top, towards the middle of the day, they will move down a little bit and they will look for them on the ground or in the lower branches. So give them plenty of height, plenty of UVB, plenty of humidity, um, decent little basking spot, and make sure you give that height is really important. Um, they will, you know, go out as well. So maybe like, a 36 by 36 by 18 or 24 or whatever might be good for a pair of them. Um, I don't like to get too much in detail about the care requirements because again, there's plenty of different ways to do it properly for individual species that doesn't all have to be exactly the same way. Checking off, crossing all of the T's and dotting the I's, you just need the check boxes done. Um, that being said, really cool species of lizard. Um, greatly looking forward to, maybe I'll be able to produce some down the road, we'll have to see. Um, as I said before, mine are still pretty small. Um, they do get along really well. I've never seen any sort of behavior of the male chasing the girl around uh, other than just like mating behavior and I have seen confirmed walks. Um, I know that they are a little small, but I still, 
uh, put a little uh, lay box filled with a lot of sphagnum moss down at the bottom of their enclosure just in case. Um, but again, really cool species of lizard. They are becoming much more popular and a little bit more inexpensive too. I remember it seemed like it was kind of, they were a little bit pricier, but everyone that I've seen, they're never more than two, $200, $250 that I've seen, except for like large adults or proven breeders. Um, so fairly inexpensive. I think a really good choice for a beginner to intermediate pet reptile. I think anything that requires, you know, larger caging for surezies, you have to, have to, have to have UVB lighting and a lot of, and a little bit larger of a spectrum and uh, heating requirements. I usually consider more intermediate, which is why I don't usually consider bearded dragons um, beginner reptiles either. But a really good choice, a very interesting, cool, unique looking reptile that kind of looks like a little alien and gives you kind of like the best of both worlds of both anoles, anoles, hmm, and chameleons as well. Really cool species. Hopefully you guys enjoy today's video. I have a whole species spotlight uh, playlist. If you want to check that out, please like and subscribe if you can. Really helps me out if you want to follow through the playlist. There's over 40 different species at this point. So not only helps my click through rate on YouTube and everything like that, helps push my videos out there so more people see them, as well as hopefully it gives you a little bit cooler knowledge, a little bit, you know, better repertoire of animals and, and things that you know a little bit about if you ever want to educate your fellow reptile keepers, uh, talk your off to the people who only like to talk about their baby puppies and kittens, everything like that. But again, hopefully you enjoyed today's video. Thank you so much, and we'll catch you next time.